you know, the scientists were saying people are wasting their time at universities studying this stuff like literature and all that when the future is with science. And the arts people are saying, oh, you're a lot of Philistines. You know, that's not proper education. Mm. There's also the religious way of looking at things. And then I realized there's another way, a more playful way that doesn't seem to be recognized. And that to me was the magical thinking. It's not which one is the true one. It's a question that these complementary, different ways of looking at the world, which all people need to some extent. Hey there, how's it going? This is James Tripp with a video for James Tripp Chaos Wave. If you are already subscribed to this channel, you know that I haven't had a video up for some number of weeks. And I've had a good reason for that. My bandwidth has been completely full. I've had the legendary Antipodean NLP trainer, James Sakalos over running his very special empty-handed NLP training here in Edinburgh. Had my good friend, John Patrick Morgan over here. You've met John Patrick Morgan in uh, other videos I've put out. We've been kicking ideas around and just generally enjoying that cerebral space. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff been going on as well. But now, I have something very special for you. A series of videos, this is the first of them, where I am in conversation with the phenomenal Lionel Snell, AKA Ramsey Jukes, better known perhaps as Ramsey Jukes, that's his pen name. Lionel is a pragmatic magician. And what I mean by that is he's not a guy that does card tricks, he's a guy with an interest in real magic and how that might work. Now, if you're triggered by that and you think magic, what are you talking about? That's like fanciful stuff. Lionel is a very grounded, very down to earth, very smart switched on guy who I've learned a phenomenal amount from. That's why I wanted to bring him onto the channel here for you to meet him and be exposed to some of his ideas. Because if you're interested in using your mind to shape your life in pragmatic ways, this material is absolutely gold. And I do want to say just by way of introduction, Lionel is, I was waving this book at the beginning of the video, Lionel is an influence on the chaos magic scene of the 70s. Not necessarily a part of it, but an influence on it. This was his 1974 book, this is the revised edition. Sex Secrets of the Black Magicians Exposed, which is a tongue-in-cheek title because whilst Lionel is an incredible thinker, he's not a guy to take himself too seriously, and this is one of the things that makes him great. In this conversation, we will be discussing the origins of Lionel's thinking, the importance of playfulness and games, recognizing magic versus defining magic, working with outcomes in magic and life, magical outcomes versus scientific outcomes, magical truth versus scientific truth, myth and narrative, the gift of belief, and when to use the critical faculty. And also we will be kicking off by referencing Lionel's most recent book, My Years of Magical Thinking, which I highly recommend anybody that wants to get deeply into Lionel's ideas and the origins of those ideas checks out for themselves. Okay, let's get into the conversation. The book's called My Years of Magical Thinking. Mm. What is it that magical thinking has done for you over these years? Well, my emphasis has always been on how different people can think differently. And so you get into arguments which really miss the point. Mm. You know, a scientist saying, oh, it's a waste of time doing tarot pack um, because it just comes from the unconscious or it's nonsense. Mm. Or a religious person saying it's the work of the devil. Mm. They're finding good reasons not to do it. But what if you enjoy it? What if you're just curious? And... I realize that there's these different ways people look at the world mm. and they just get into arguments that, that clash. And when it, this in the 50s, it was a very skeptical scientific period. And this idea came from C.P. Snow of the difference between the arts and the sciences. Some people think artistically, some scientifically. Mm. And it was beginning to be that sort of argument. You know, the scientists were saying, we don't need all these um, people are wasting their time at universities studying this stuff like literature and all that when the yeah. future is with science. And, you know, computers will soon be able to analyze style and things like that. You know, this is nonsense. And the arts people are saying, oh, you're a lot of Philistines. You know, that's not proper education. Mm. But he pointed out that actually that it's not 
which one is the true one. It's a question that these complementary, different ways of looking at the world, which all people need to some extent. Mm. That's what set me thinking. I realized, you know, there's also the religious way of looking at things. Mm. And then I realized there's another way, a more playful way that, of looking at things, which doesn't seem to be recognized. And that to me was the magical thinking. Mm. Uh, it's very much to do with finding what works or what feels good for you. You know, if the tarot is fun to do and it gives you interesting results, the fact that someone says, oh, that just comes from your conscious, well, so what? You know, I'm getting yeah. interesting results. This is worthwhile. Yeah. The fact that someone says it's the work of the devil, well, there some people say the whole world is the work of the devil. Yeah. <laughs> Why not try to learn something from it? Mm. So this sort of playful way of looking at things and then I realized as I was growing up that um, the nearest people to that are the people who call themselves magicians, people who were prepared to sort of explore their own thinking and their ways of looking at things. And they had many different theories, you know, about spirits and things like that. But basically they were trying things to see what worked. Mm. And whereas a lot of people were saying, don't do it because. <laughs> so yeah. that's why I put a, a very big emphasis on what I call magical thinking. Because mm. if you just get some old book of spells and you treat as though it's a science textbook, you know, mix this with that and everything, mm. I think some people get results that way. But most people realize they're just not approaching it in the right spirit. Mm. You know, I must have seven candles because it's a Venus spell and the seven is a number of Venus. Mm. You know, actually, it requires much more thinking, what is Venus about? beauty, love, there's much more to it than just getting a number right. Mm. And there's a whole different way of thinking, which in many ways is closer to artistic thinking. Mm. Mm. So that was really my starting point. Right. And there's, there's so much richness in that. I mean, there's so many elements of what you've just said that spark for me. Mm. Um, the playfulness, the idea mm. of playfulness, uh, and you talk a lot about games, which is a big thing for me. I often mm -hmm. use in my own work when I'm coaching people, I talk about the game frame. If you look at anything as a game and mm -hmm. look at what would it take to master that game mm -hmm. um, or to move towards mastery in that game. Mm -hmm. And often if you see somebody who is playing a game, let's pick a game like a sport, for example, and we mm -hmm. see them play at a very high level, like a particular piece of play, we'll say, wow, that was magical. You know, there's, yeah. there's a quality that comes out when somebody really plays a game exquisitely mm. that you could say to anyone, you could say to a, a very skeptical thinker, a very scientific person, you could say, that was magic. And yeah. they wouldn't say, hang on, yeah. magic doesn't exist. They'd say, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know exactly yeah. what you meant. That's it, yes. Right, so, so I love that idea of games and playfulness in, in mm. your approach and what you talk about. Yes, yeah. So I do mm. like that approach. Mm. The other couple of things I want to flag about what, what you know, actually respond to that. There's something you want to respond, but I'm very excited yeah. about a couple of other things. Well, well just one thing is um, I always rather liked Nietzsche's saying the maturity of man is when he rediscovers the seriousness of a child at play. That's right. It. So play can be very serious as yeah. well as be playful. It's, it's, um, it's a lovely mixture that. That's a wonderful thing. There was one other thing. People say that's magic. Mm. and they recognize it. Mm. Now, I think to me, there's a distinction. Some people say, well, how do you define magic? Some things are better recognized than defined. Mm. Uh, if you'd asked me at 14 to define beauty of a woman, mm. I could have given a definition because I was madly in love with Bridget Bardot, you know, mm. tall, athletic, blonde, this, that, the other. And of course, later in life, I fall in love with someone who's totally different, mm. doesn't fit any of that criteria. And, and similarly, when I try to, the only time I bought myself a place to live. The um, estate agent asked me to write down, you know, exactly the conditions, what I wanted to tick boxes and all that type of thing. Mm. And they looked at it and they said, you won't get anything like that at your price level in mm. Hampshire. Um, I said, well, what have you got? And the first place they took me to was completely different to what mm. anything I'd expected, but I just saw it and thought, wow, I could live here. So people sometimes say you can't do anything unless you first define it. But I think there's a lot of things that actually it's better to recognize it. Mm. With it. And magic is a bit like that. It's um, right. Say that's magic. And you don't need to define what magic is to recognize as something very special there.
Right. And, and I think that's a really, it's such an interesting thing that you would say that. I like that point about not necessarily defining it, which you refuse to do in mm. my years of magical thinking, which I thought was a very mm. interesting approach. Mm. Um, the other thing there that, that you've mentioned is about not necessarily overly defining outcomes, overly mm. prescribing oh, yes. exactly how things need to be. Uh, it's mm. very interesting that you should mention that because the last person I spoke to on this channel was a chap called James Sakalos from Australia, who's an NLP mm. trainer. And in NLP, yeah. there's an idea of, of well-formed outcomes. It's an old NLP idea. Uh, yes, yes. Um, which one of the founders, John Grinder, has renounced and said he regrets that idea of well-formed outcomes. Uh, oh, I'm glad, yes. Yeah. Um, and we were having a long discussion about the benefits of working with emergence, of engaging in something in a particular way, and then yeah. allowing results to emerge. I call it non-linear generative engagement. Oh, and yes. and yeah. I'm very fond of the Steve Jobs quote, you cannot connect the dots looking forward, only looking backward. Oh, and yes. I, I think that really encompasses something about your uh, approach yeah. to outcomes and results. Because the thing about magical thinking for you, you've mentioned it being playful and you've mentioned it mm. being fun, but you've mm. also mentioned it being pragmatic. It is about getting some good results. It's, it's about mm. getting some good things happening. Mm. Uh, mm. But I think that you have a particular nuance that's often missing in terms mm. of, uh, to reference another video I made recently, which is how to hold an outcome mm. of, you know, being able to work in a direction, work productively with something, set direction, but not become so attached to something that there's no flexibility in there. There's no yes. opportunity yeah. for um, surprising things to occur mm. and no, you know, space for that. Yeah. Um, I'd love for you to say something about that, pragmatism yes, and outcomes. Yes. I think that's very interesting um, because I know there is, and some uh, chaos magicians say you must specify absolutely accurately what you want. Mm. Now, I think that sometimes when people first approach magic, they think it's about, you know, oh, I want to turn lead into gold. I want to get the girl next door to fall in love with me. Very specific things like that. Mm. Now, actually, when you work with magic, you begin to get a sense of there are more important directions in life. Mm. Something more like what I would say fulfillment or Crowley would say, finding and doing your true will. Mm. So very often what you think you immediately want is actually there's something bigger that you actually need, which is um, you, you find. And I, the most sort of obvious example I, I give is, um, you know, people... Uh, magicians and one of them gets cancer mm -hmm. now of course at the back of their minds they hope that the next day when they go to see him there's a complete remission and it's gone but very often something different happens like when they go to their friend who was in distress they find him looking different mm. and he says something like you know i realized all my life afraid of something like this cancer now i know i've only got six months to live i'm going to live there's books i, I want to write the places i want to visit i'm going to do these things i'm really going to live for the first time mm. now people who experience that they say wow a healing has taken place not necessarily what they would have predicted but they recognize that something important and healing has happened mm. Now, of course, from a scientific point of view, this is a rubbish, you know. Mm. Well, he's still ill, he's still going to die, you know. But that healing is not a trivial thing. Mm. Because the sort of healing which can affect other people, you know, other members of the group start thinking about their lives, things like that. So something very significant has happened. Mm. And quite often with magic, something like a tarot reading, it is when you look back and you see that actually something very helpful was triggered which led forward mm. and and it can be quite surprising so that is one of the things that distinguishes you know scientists from magicians scientists want a precise explanation of the outcome mm. you know what exactly is going to happen when venus crosses your ascendant whereas the astrologer would say something broader that the themes of love and communication and beauty and harmony are somehow being highlighted in me. 
and I can be open to that and make use of that. Mm. Um, and then they can look back and say, wow, you know, that art exhibition I went to was fantastic. It changed my life. It's sort of, they recognize something important has happened looking back mm. and they're open to it rather than sort of sitting, waiting for, I don't know, the girl next door to come and kiss them or something, some very specific thing, you know, that yeah. it's an openness. And I think that's quite an important part of magic. And one of the things that sets it apart and causes misunderstanding with scientists. Yes, and I think that's a very interesting point about misunderstanding with scientists. One of the things I really loved about your view is a lot of people that are into stuff like magic or, or, or whatever, they can get quite defensive around mm -hmm. science. Yeah. Um, yes. And you don't seem to get defensive at all around science, which I, I really yeah. like. Yeah. <laughs> in, there, there were points in your book, I think you, you were pointing out that a scientist could say that is rubbish, that is nonsense, that is not true. And that mm. to be an absolutely valid position from a science perspective. Yes, yes. You know, so so in, you've got that, that real ability to say, yes, look, that is, you know, what the scientist is saying there isn't a threat. It's true from where they're coming from. Yeah. Mm. Um, and it changes nothing about where I'm coming from and, and what I'm doing. And, mm. you know, because it's a different, it's a completely different mode of engagement with the world. Mm. Science yes. is yeah. a completely different mode of engagement. So something can be magically true and scientifically false or, scientifically true yeah. and magically false or yeah. artistically false or yes. you know religiously so or, or whatever and i think that's you know that's yeah. such a, a profoundly powerful thing so there's no contradiction there between mm. yeah no, I, I could just give one example i mean uh, it seems funny to call history a science but for many people it is you know it's facts mm. check them verify them record them and everything um and if you're using the tarot pack one of the nice myths about the tarot pack is that the ancient Egyptians instilled their wisdom in these cards mm. so that they would live on as a game. Mm. Um, a historian could say there's no reference to the tarot pack before the Middle Ages. This is nonsense. It was just a game that came then. Mm. So for the scientific point of view, that means all that Egyptian myth stuff is nonsense. Mm. But magical point of view, just because it appeared in the Middle Ages, doesn't mean there might not, I mean, it might be Jungian archetypes that in the deep human subconscious have been carried through into it, or it might be that people had picked up stories from gypsies which had come from Egypt. You know, there's many very indirect ways that wisdom from the past can arrive. Mm. And you're not, again, putting an alternative historical view. This is actually what happened. You're just open to the fact that information flows in a mysterious way through people. Mm. And so you go on believing that it's got the wisdom of the ancient Egyptians in it and it works. You know? yeah. mm. So it's that sort of um, rather than using your knowledge to stop things and say this can't happen, which you need to do in science. You need to simplify and cut down into what you're actually going to look at. Mm. You know, it's good scientific practice, but magical. You want to be open up to possibilities rather than shutting down like that. Mm. And I think there's an interesting thing in the, idea of histories and alternative histories or whatever, or various interpretations, if they're looked at in narrative terms, mm. one of the things that's sort of a, a huge part of what I do is I work with people helping them reorganize their personal narratives, their narratives about who they are, who they're not, what the world is, what the world is, and what this situation means. Mm. I've done a lot of work with people who have the, the label, the diagnosis, post-traumatic stress disorder, which I think is a problematic diagnosis mm. or a problematic label is conceptualized mm. in unuseful ways oftentimes mm. but you've also got this phenomenon that's recognized out there called post-traumatic growth oh yes and, yeah. and if you look well who grew who became more as a result of a traumatic experience and yes. who, was, oh, yes. you know, who was undermined by it and you look at the difference and the difference that, that seems to make the difference much of the time is the stories they told themselves about what it meant Ah, yes, yes. Mm. You know, and there's an incredible power in story, in narrative, in meaning making. And, mm. you know, I think you can look at history from two perspectives. You can take a scientific view, go, we must find out exactly what happened. And I think mm. that's a very valid thing. I'm very, I'm fascinated by history. I love to read 
mm. um, you know, the latest discoveries of archaeology. Archaeology is constantly mm. uncovering, mm. well, literally uncovering yeah. new things. Yes. Um, and and there's, a, there's a part of me that, that is interested in the facts, but I'm more interested in the narrative. And, and I recognize myself as a creative weaver of that narrative and that I weave it to suit me in mm. some ways. Mm. Um, I pull meaning out of it. That, mm. that makes sense of things in ways that have me orientate myself more effectively in the world. Mm. So I'm kind of yes. using historical narrative, I think, from the mm. way you seem to describe it, what you would describe as magically. I'm using it yes. magically. Yeah. Mm. Um, and there's a great phrase. I mean, I'm all about narrative and I'm all about meaning making. And there's mm. a wonderful phrase, and I'm pretty sure this was from your book. And you talked about the gift of belief. The science yes. of giving the gift oh, yes. belief. Mm. If, if there's one thing that you said that really I just thought was so exquisitely elegantly put, mm. that you know that was it. The gift of belief. Ah yes, yes, yes. Should I just sort of explain that? It's yes, sort of, please do. Yes, yeah. Yes, because um, uh, a typical question, if you're talking to a rationalist, you'd say, yes, but do you really believe in fairies or do you really believe in the tarot pack? Now, I say that that's one of the fundamental sort of, it's another thing where scientists and magicians can't communicate because really believe means you think it's absolutely true that fairies are a scientifically verifiable thing that sooner or later people are going to measure them in the laboratories. Mm. I say, and I draw the comparison with art, the person who says, I've shown that the tarot pack is nonsense because it wasn't discovered until the Middle Ages, whatever. If you took him to see a Shakespeare play, mm. and as soon as it started, he stood up and said, stop, stop, this is a fraud. This man isn't the Prince of Denmark. You know, he's just an actor from the East End, blah, blah, blah. This is not a... Um, people would think he was an idiot. Mm. They wouldn't be impressed. And you realize that when you go to the theater, you're giving, some people call it suspension of disbelief. Mm. I say, actually, you're giving a gift of belief. Mm. You're giving yourself to that play and you can come away and have a life changing experience if it's a really good play. You know, mm. it, it's significant what you can get back. And that's really what you're doing in magic. When you take the tarot pack, you may know as you shuffle it that this is a thing that was only discovered since the Middle Ages, but you sort of open up to the idea that it's got ancient wisdom that goes back to time immemorial. And you spread those cards and you get a, a good results. And what you've done is you've given this gift of belief mm. and you're getting a feedback from it. You're getting a gift back. And the more, I mean, the smallest gift of belief is to say, well, yes, I know it's, it's all a fraud about this ancient history, but it does have meaningful images which means something to my subconscious so i'm tapping my subconscious now that's a very small gift of belief and you'll get quite a good reading for that and as you learn to get good readings your belief you can give more a bigger gift of belief i really think there's something more than just subconscious imagery in this it really seems to touch important facts in the universe mm. as you give a bigger gift you begin to get better results mm. so um now, of course, the scientist worries about that. They'll say, oh, you're just kidding yourself. You're just deluding. You're just going off the rails. Mm. But I always say that um, don't forget reason. What you do is you bring in reason to look at the actual results you're getting. Mm. Say, that really was an interesting result. Mm. You know, um, judge them. That didn't seem to tell me anything. You know, so, so. You use the critical faculties, but you use them after you've got results. Mm. And that's like, you could look at this Shakespeare play, you can be totally carried away with it. And as you come out, you can say, the casting was magnificent, but I think the director could have done better on this, that, and the other. In other mm. words, you can be critical after, but allow yourself to have the good experience, allow yourself to learn mm. before you start picking it to bits. Right. Um, and I think that's a hugely powerful thing. I mentioned before in our previous conversation that we had that was unrecorded for the world at large mm -hmm. about um, in NLP, there's something called a Disney creative strategy, uh, uh, yes. which was allegedly modeled off Walt Disney. And um, I probably really ought to know the process of it. But the point is, is 
early on, the early on phase is the dreamer. And it's absolutely imperative that when you are dreaming, when you're connecting up these possibilities, you keep the sort of realist and the critic out. They have their role. Yeah. They have their role when it comes to other aspects down the line. But it's mm. absolutely important you keep it out because if the critic's there up front, the critic is yes. slicing through everything with the sword of reason yeah. and chopping it into tiny pieces. Yeah, that's absolutely it, yes. I mean, you, you can dream up this wonderful, um, inspiring film scenario or something. Mm. But when it's actually getting towards being made, you have to think of things like, is this going to be good for the box office? That's when you start thinking of it, you know, mm. I think we need a car chase in to, get, yeah. to make it work. You know, that's, that's when that sort of thinking comes in. But don't let it stop just saying, oh, no one's interested in fairy stories now or like that. You know, if yeah. you start at the beginning, you just kill the thing dead. Right. Okay, so that's part one of this conversation with the phenomenal Lionel Snell. Make sure you check out part two. There's going to be a part three, maybe even a part four, depending on how I chunk it. If you like this video, please do give the video the thumbs up. If you're interested on rare knowledge on using your mind to shape your life that you will not get anywhere else, make sure you subscribe to this channel and hit the notifications bell. Also, there's a comment section below. Ask questions, share your feedback. That way, the Chaos Wave conversation gets to continue.